Thank you. So the next speaker is Professor John Edward Hopcroft. Uh, Professor Hopcroft is an American theoretical computer scientist best known for his work on automata, formal languages, and algorithms, and his textbooks on the theory of computation algorithm, which are regarded as standards in their fields. <clears throat> he is the IBM professor of engineering and applied mathematics in computer science at Cornell University. He received his master's degree and PhD from Stanford University. He worked for three years at Princeton University and since then has been at Cornell University. In 1986, he received the Turing Award jointly with Robert Tajan for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis, analysis of algorithms. Professor Hopcroft is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. In 2010, he and Jeffrey Ullman received IEEE John von Neumann Medal for many seminal contributions to theoretical computer science. His book co-authors include Jeffrey Ullman, Alfred Eho, and others. So please, Professor Hopcroft. Oh, thank, thank you uh, yeah, uh, for, for the introduction. And uh, following Al's comments about what uh, uh, students should, should work on, one of the things that I tell a student is if you're going to do fundamental research, it ought to be research which is exciting to you. In, in other words, don't do research that your faculty advisor tells you to work on because that will be work. You want to do what excites you because that, that will really be fun. And, and the other comment I will make is that the world is changing and uh, you should ought to position yourself for the future. And I, I tell my students uh, one story about my own career. Uh, the fact that when I was at Princeton, Ed McCluskey asked me to create a course in computer science. At that time, there were no departments of computer science. There were no courses. There were no books. And uh, teaching that course made me one of the world's first computer scientists. And I didn't realize at the time what the consequences of that would be. Uh, but when our government wanted a senior person uh, in computer science, I was on the short list. And uh, when I was fairly young, I got a call from our White House saying our president wanted to appoint me to the National Science Foundation, which oversees science funding in the US. Now imagine if I had been in high energy particle physics. I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire. But because there were no senior faculty ahead of me, I had opportunities that one would just not expect to have. So I, the other thing I guess I would tell students is position yourself for the future. And, and that actually goes not just for people, it goes for companies and it goes for countries. But, but with that, I will, I will start my, my talk. Uh, it turns out that I believe we're undergoing an information revolution. And the impact of this revolution is gonna be as, as important as the impact of the agricultural revolution or the Industrial Revolution. And it turns out that machine learning is going to be an important driver of, of this revolution. Uh, and one of the main things which is speeding it up is deep learning. And so in this talk, I'm going to start by giving you a kind of a, a little bit of background about AI, and then I'm going to talk about research uh, problems in deep learning. So uh, one of the things in AI was a little unit called a threshold logic unit. Uh, and uh, this unit has a number of inputs, x1, x2, x3, and each input has a weight. And what it does is it sums the input times the weight. Uh, and if the sum is less than some threshold, it outputs a zero. Otherwise, it outputs a one. 
Now, we've, we've moved from just this threshold to something a little bit more, a little different, because as we make networks of these gates, we want to be able to take the derivative of an error function. And the threshold is not a derivative function. So we replace the threshold sometimes with a sigmod function. And uh, actually, more recently, uh, a function that works very well is a function that gives zero output uh, if the sum is negative and gives the out input as the output if the sum is positive. And that's a very simple, it can be, uh, you take a derivative of that. And I want to give you the algorithm uh, to train a threshold logic unit. Initially, you set the weights to zero, and then you cycle through all inputs. And if the out input is misclassified and you want a one output, you add the input to the weight vector. Uh, if you want a zero output, then you subtract the, the uh, input from the, from the weight vector. And there's just one thing uh, to remember about this, I'll tell you in a minute, but if your data is linearly separable, this algorithm will quickly converge to a set of weights which will separate the, the data. But what if your data is not linearly separable? Oh, oh the, the one thing I want you to remember is that the weight vector will be a linear sum of patterns. Because remember, we set the weight vector to zero, and every time we changed the weight vector, we either added or subtracted an input. So uh, the weight vector will always be a linear sum of the input patterns. If the data is not linearly separable, uh, what you might do is you might map the data to a higher dimensional space where it is linearly separable. And in this case, what I might do is I might add a third coordinate. And I'm going to take each data point and depending on how far it is from the origin, move it out from the, the plane that the data was originally in. And the zeros, you can see, are farther from the origin than the x's. So I'm going to pull the zeros out, and I can easily put a plane between the zeros and x's. OK. Now, it may be that the mapping you're going to use, the function f, may map the input to an infinite dimensional space. Uh, but the interesting thing is you don't need to be able to compute the function f, because you don't need it to run this algorithm. All you need is the products of the mappings of images. So the way this algorithm would work in the higher dimensional space, I got my input ai, and it gets mapped to f of ai, and the weight vector is going to be a linear combination of the mappings. Now notice, that if I want to multiply the weight vector times a pattern, f of aj, I don't need to know the value of f of aj. All I need is the product of f of ai and f of aj. And so, uh, if, and when I want to upgrade the weight vector, if I'm going to add f of aj to the weight vector, uh, all I need to do is increase the coefficient by one. OK. So what that suggests uh, is the concept of what we call a kernel. Rather than pick a function f, why don't we pick a matrix of products? And uh, can I just select an arbitrary matrix? Not quite. I've got to select a matrix for which there exists a function which would give rise to that matrix. And it, it turns out that it'll be, that's true uh, if and only if the matrix is positive semi-definite. So I'll give you an example of a matrix you could pick, uh, the Gaussian kernel. If I want to know what the element of this matrix, uh, the ijth element is, I need to know what f of ai times f of aj is. And it turns out I simply take the difference between the input ai and the input aj take the length of that vector, multiply it by a constant, and raise e to that power. And so I never actually had to calculate what the function was 
that would gives rise to this Gaussian kernel. And in fact, this mapping is one to a, an infinite dimensional space. And there are many kernels like this. And this is the basis of what's called a support vector machine. Uh, and the support vector machine is what was driving AI for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, and, it, and it was very successful. But the, the thing that accelerated the area of AI is deep learning. And so let me talk about that. Uh, what, what drove this uh, <clears throat> was something called the ImageNet competition. Uh, it, they had 1.2 million images which were labeled, and there were a thousand categories. And so maybe one was cat, one was car, another airplane. And they ran a competition, and what you would do is you would develop an algorithm, and they would give you some training data, and you would train your algorithm on that, and then you would look to see how well your algorithm generalized to some test data. And up until about uh, 2012, the error rate was about 25%, and the improvements from one year to another were only a small fraction of a percent. But in 2012, uh, uh, AlexNet came along, and all of a sudden the error rate dropped to 15%. And this is, it was really exciting because this was a major achievement. And at this point, people started applying deep learning to many problems uh, in finance and sociology and all kinds of problems and deep learning was very successful. People don't know why it was so successful but it was successful. Uh, along then in um, 2014 uh, GoogleNet came along and dropped the error rate to 6.6 percent and then ResNet came along dropped it to 3.6 percent and if you have a trained human being, their error rate is about 5%. So the computer now programs are better than a trained human being. Uh, I guess I should point out that ResNet, these networks got deeper and deeper, and ResNet is actually a thousand levels deep. And so you might ask how they train it and so forth. These are interesting issues. So let, let me quickly uh, point out that uh, what we're talking about here is supervised learning. Uh, you put in an image and you try to get the classification of that image correct and you do that by changing the weights uh, in these various levels. And to do that you have to uh, take a derivative and that's an interesting uh, problem how when these networks get a thousand levels deep how you do that. But something that is interesting Someone came along and said, let's do something different. Let's put in an image and train the network to reproduce the image. Now I don't have to tell you how the image is classified. And what they observed is that these uh, gates in here formed a better representation of the image. And in fact, someone pointed out that one of these gates would respond if the image was that of a cat. Nobody told the computer which images were cats and which were not, but the computer figured that out. And all of a sudden we realized that maybe we could do unsupervised learning, and this is an important area of research today. Now the actual networks that people use are slightly different, and what network you use depends on whether you're doing, looking at images or whether you're looking at speech, uh, and I'm going to just focus on images. Uh, in images, they have something called a convolutional level. And what you do is you take a small little uh, uh, grid, uh, typically it's five by five, but to get this on the slide, I made it three by three. And what you do is you slide this little image across. And for each position, as you move it across, you have a gate. And then you move it down one row, slide it across, and you have a number of gates here equal to the number of pixels in your image. And what this little window does is it, it looks for a certain feature. Uh, it might look for an edge or a corner or something like that. And what you want to do, oh, by the way, the, the weights associated with each position here are the same. 
So if you had a five by five window, you'd only have 25 weights, uh, not, not a million weights. But you want to find various features, so there are many of these convolutional uh, setups in a, in a particular level. Uh, then to, to try to keep the networks a little smaller, there's another level called pooling, where they have a two by two window, and what they do is move it across, but when they move it, they move it two units at a time, so there isn't overlapping. And they take either the maximum value or the average value. And the reason they can do that is it's not so important exactly where a feature occurs, but how the features occur relative to one another. And so this, this seems to work, and they put together, um, uh, AlexNet, by the way, had five of these convolutional levels, and then three fully connected levels, and then something called uh, softmax. Okay. And so you put an image in there, and they trained it to pr produce the right classification. Now, now what I'm going to do here is, is talk a little bit about some, some research. And I'm going to talk about something called the activation vector. You put an image in, and you'll get a value in each of these gates at this uh, given level. So the, I, I have a vector uh, for each image, okay? But it turns out that there are two notions of activation space, because I could put those columns in a matrix, uh, and in one case, I put in an image, and I get a vector representing it. The other is I look at just one gate, that's coming across, and what I ask, I want is a vector there, where for each coordinate corresponds to an image, and it tells me uh, what that gate is representing. So let me show you some things that you can do here. Um, the first thing is, if I have an image, it's easy to find the activation vector. I simply put it into my network and see what the, uh, the activation vector is. But suppose you gave me an activation vector and wanted to know what image produced that. Uh, there are many ways to solve this problem. I'm just going to give you one that's easy to understand. Pick a random image, find out what its activation vector is, and then do gradient descent on the pixels of the random image to move this activation vector up to that activation vector. Uh, and so you go like that, and then what that will do is that will convert your random image to the image that produced the activation vector A sub I. I, I just wanted to point out that you could go from activation space back to the image, uh, because now I'll show you what you might do with it. Uh, when I put an image into this network, I might take the activation vector here and say that's the content of the image. And then what I might do is I might take a vector here and take the cross product and say that's the style of the image. And the reason I take the cross product is that tells me how adjacent pixels are related to one another. So if you do that, we took a picture of George Bush, our former president, and then uh, we found the activation vector, and we said we're going to use that for the content of the president. But then we took 200 images of older people, and we said we're going to use the average of their activation vector for the style, and then we recreated the image using the content of George Bush, but the style of an older person. And this is what we got. Now, one of the things that I do uh, is each, each year I bring 30 or 40 students from China over uh, to Cornell University. And these are students who have just finished their junior year. And each of them is asked to do a research project. And one of them did the following. They took a picture of Cornell University. And they said, what would Cornell University look like if it was in China? So they took a piece of Asian artwork, and this is what they got as Cornell University if it was located in China. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is this activation space. 
uh, because it's very high dimensional. But if you take all of the images of cats, they will form a manifold, a much lower dimensional manifold in this activation space. And understanding what this manifold is, I think is gonna be important to understanding why deep learning works. And let me just, just repeat, there have been thousands of people who have applied deep learning in various application areas, and they are very successful. But nobody seems to understand why deep learning works so well, and that theory still needs to be developed. So I'll just show you some other things that we can do. Uh, here, here is a, a photo of Cornell University, and then we took some styles coming across here, and we asked what would Cornell look like under each of those styles, and that's this bottom line. But what we used is we used a pre-trained network, and we asked the question, do you really have to train a deep learning network to do various things? And so we tried the experiment again with random weights, and we did just about as well. Okay, and so one of the things that's important is to ask for each thing you're doing, does it require the training or is it the structure of the network that, that uh, causes it to happen? And here is just a, a list of some projects. Uh, interesting, what do individual gates learn? How does what the second level gates learn differ from the first and, and, and so on? Uh, I, I guess I should mention something about how does what a gate learns evolves over time. One of these juniors that I brought over to Cornell was training a network and was watching what happened. Uh, and he observed that three gates started to learn the size of the image. He was using black and white images. And then after a little while, two of them gave up and decided that the network didn't need to learn, have three gates learn the same thing. And these other two shifted and started to learn something else. And you can see that there's a fundamental research project there. Why did it, these gates give up and start to learn something else? Uh, unfortunately, he was only at Cornell for a month, and he only discovered this towards the end and didn't have time to explain why. But uh, there's just really exciting research here. Uh, to ask if two gates learn the same thing, uh, what you might do is take the activation vectors for two gates uh, and take the covariance. And if the covariance is one, uh, then they're learning the same thing. Uh, and so you might do the following. Uh, if I have two networks, I put the gates of one network going across for columns and uh, going down for rows for the other and calculate the covariance. And what you might discover, one of the questions we were asking is if you trained a network twice, does it learn the same thing or does it learn it entirely different ways? And a particular example that we tried, we found a gate in one network which was really highly correlated with what the gate in another uh, learned, but it was only a few gates that we could match up. But then we noticed that there was a couple gates, three and four in one network, which together learned the same thing that gates two and seven learned in the other. And so it looks like they were learning the same subspace, but they just had a different coordinate system for it. Uh, point out that when you train one of these networks, there's a large number of local minima. At least we believe they're local minima. They may not be. Uh, in three dimensions, uh, if you're training something, if you're doing gradient descent, uh, you're not going to get stuck at a saddle point. Because if there's a saddle point where in one direction you can go down and another direction it goes up, a just numerical error is going to prevent you from being at that saddle point and you're going to continue on down. But when you're in a million dimensions, that may not be true. Because if there are only, say, ten dimensions that go down, you might not be able to find them. And it might be these local minima are actually saddle points. And so a research question is, how do you determine in high dimension whether you're at a minimum? But I'm going to just show you something. Um, <clears throat> let's say I train a network, and on the training data, this is the error curve, you'll notice that there are two local minima, both about the same. 
which one should you pick? Well, you'd like to ask the question, which one is going to generalize better? This is the error for the training data, but how about for real data? And I will conjecture that you ought to take the broad one rather than the sharp one. The reason for that is if you picture training data statistically from the full set, then the, the error function for the testing data should be this, roughly the same as for the training data, just slightly different. And so let me put the error function up for the real data. That's this dotted line. It's, it's shifted a little. But notice when you have a broad uh, minimum, when you shift it a little, the error function doesn't go up very much. But when you have a very sharp local minima and you shift it a little, the error function goes up significantly. So these are just interesting questions um, that lead to lots of interesting research. Um, one of the things, if you have two tasks and you learn them separately, you might ask, what would happen if we learn these two tasks together? Or what is common to these two tasks? And so I can take these two networks and change them just slightly. If I pull a few of these gates out and share them, and now I train, it's going to turn out that things which are common to the two tasks are going to be learned by these uh, gates, and these are going to be things which are specific to the lower task and those specific to the upper task. Um, and all, all I wanted to do here is just show you the excited kinds of things because there's just millions of questions we can ask and things to explore that we don't really understand. I, just to keep on time, I'm going to go kind of quickly here. Um, something which is very important is the notion of, of a generative adversarial network. At one time, people were trying to create realistically looking images. Like to feed in the word cat and would like an image of a cat to come out. And they were not doing very well. But someone had the idea of saying, why don't we train a network, which is called the synthetic image discriminator, which can tell the difference between a real image and a generated image. So I'll take a thousand real images and a thousand generated images and I'll train this network. Then what I will do is I will take my image generator and plug it in and then I will start training my image generator until it fools the synthetic uh, detector. At that point, I will start training the synthetic image discriminator a little bit more and I'll alternate these and what they discovered is pretty soon they get images out which really look like real images. And uh, you can use this for many things. Uh, one of the things you might want to do is develop a translator from one language to another. Uh, the way we used to do it is we'd find many documents where we had a copy in both languages. But if we didn't have that, what would we do? Well, we might use a discriminator. We first uh, take away, let's say I'm going to translate from English to, to German. I take something which will take an English sentence and just produce a bunch of German words. Then I will take a discriminator which will tell me the difference between something which is just a bunch of German words and something which is a German sentence. And then I will get another translator which takes German back to English and I will uh, train these three things until the output uh, back to English is the same as the input. And if you think about this, what this forces to happen is the first translator to German has to create a sentence and to get the final from the English back to be the, what you put in, uh, it better be a translation of the English sentence. Uh, and this just suggests the, the wide range of things you might do with a, uh, 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 this adversarial uh, uh, discriminator. Uh, what people are trying to do is compress these networks. Uh, these networks are getting so big that if you want to put it on your iPhone, there's a problem. 
And we don't seem to be able to train a little network like this if we try to train it to get the right classification. So people are now doing the following. They train a big network to work well. Then they take the activation vector and say, could we train this network to produce the activation vector rather than the classification? Uh, and uh, we're going to see how, how well people can do there. Um, you've probably heard of fooling. Uh, you can take an image of a cat, which will be correctly classified. You can change a few pixels, and you probably can't even tell that those two pictures are different. But all of a sudden, the deep network said, oh, it's an automobile. Uh, <laughs> and the reason for that is in that activation space, that manifold, is if you move off that manifold perpendicular to it, you're going to change the classification. Now, this isn't going to cause you a problem. The reason this is misclassified is you could quickly tell it was not a real image because there's a pixel in there which has no relationship to the adjacent pixel, and there's a few of these. And uh, if you just filter this image, it will get back to classification of a cat. But people have found that they can actually take real images and fool things. Uh, very quickly, uh, when my daughter was two, three years old, I used to go through the best word book ever and point at pictures. And one of the pictures I pointed at was fire engine, a single picture. And we were out for a walk, and there was a fire engine on the street, and she pointed to it and said, fire engine. She learned from one picture. These deep networks are learning from thousands of pictures. Uh, how are we going to teach it to learn from one picture? And it's possible that my daughter had certain practice. She had seen billions of pictures before, and she learned how to learn from pictures. But uh, just at the end, people always ask me the question, is artificial intelligence real? And um, AI programs do not uh, extract the essence of an object and understand its function or other important aspects. It's, uh, it's merely pattern recognition in high dimensional space. And so uh, if, if you trained a deep network to recognize railroad cars, yeah, uh, and you gave it a picture like this, it would probably say boxcar, not realizing it's an engine. Uh, because it doesn't look like that. But let me just uh, wind up. Uh, not all intelligent tasks uh, need AI. Some just need computing power. And, and with that, I will uh, conclude.